know that they would roll dice and somehow read them to determine the answer to some of the questions that were being raised. The soldiers that were put in the hall will look at the soldier uh, and the soldiers uh, and reach the head, but they roll dice to see who would take the outer garment of Jesus. Uh, and it was something that they received an answer from dice and Oh. 
that we don't understand all the, under, all the things that can be understood, but he did not break a law. If that had taken place, he would not be eligible, worthy of taking our place on that cross. So it had to be something that uh, was not a legal idea. Uh, are you confused about why I'm saying those things? Didn't Jesus, and you don't look confused, but I'm wanting to be certain we aren't confused. Uh, there are so many times, and we're going to see it in our sermon this morning, when the Jews, the Sanhedrin, would make an accusation against Jesus. And he would accuse them of breaking Jewish law. But it wasn't... to point out how they were establishing traditions and in doing that they were superseding the legitimate commands of God. Uh, Matthew 10 talks about declaring Corban. Remember we saw that last year as we were spending time with Jesus. They would declare something Corban, uh, a gift devoted to God. And in making that declaration of their personal goods, as a gift devoted to God, they were breaking the command, and it was a clear command to the Jew that you should honor mother and father, and you should provide for them is the reason for the command. And so they were saying, I'm not going to use my things, my possessions, don't want to use them up in providing for mom and dad, so I'm going to declare it a gift devoted to God. And that will let me keep it, and not honor father and mother. And he spoke against that very strongly and pointed out, of course, to us the perfect uh, rendering of where they added tradition outside of the Sabbath. We're going to see that in our sermon this morning. And the final conviction was uh, the final breaking of their traditions or of their commands, if you will, is he was convicted and executed the same day at his trial. And that was not to ever be allowed to happen. So 11 things the Sanhedrin had in their records as far as their operational procedures, and they broke every one of them. They broke every one of them in order to get him on the cross before 6 p.m., before the Passover began. And we'll see some more about that later. Uh, the trials themselves usually were on Mondays and Thursdays. And usually there was a quorum required, 23 members constituted a quorum of what they then called the Great Sanhedrin. So that would allow them to meet. Uh, in criminal trials, a majority of one vote was sufficient for an acquittal. And that's similar to jurisprudence in our world. Um, some trials aren't trying to prove someone innocent they're trying to prove reasonable doubt from one person so that that one person will free the individual. And that's very common uh, in the trial system. Uh, certain witnesses were disallowed in Hebrew trials, the Jewish trials. Gentiles, women, minors, slaves, idiots, and lunatics. Deaf mutes, blind men, gamblers, usurers, illiterate or immodest persons, persons convicted of irreligious or immorality, relatives by affinity, and all persons interested in the case. Now, did any of that jump out at you when I read it? 
idiots and lunatics uh, jumped out at me. Uh, the, fact, the, the fact that that was actually written somewhere and forces us to read it publicly, uh, but we can understand if you're wanting a truthful witness, if you're wanting some with the ability to rationalize thought, disciplined of time frames and all the things that might be involved, uh, certainly that would be a part of having that on a list. Um, let's look at some of the charges in some detail against Jesus. Again, these are put together from gospel accounts. They're references to circumstances that occurred, but I don't have verses for them. I don't think we will argue against any of them. It's just general ideas put together so as to put him on trial. Uh, it's inference, which would not be allowed in an American trial, but he was a preacher of turbulence and faction. Uh, these are extrajudicial charges. He flattered the poor and inveined against the rich, taught against the rich. He denounced whole cities extra judiciary charges. He gathered about him a rabble of publicans and harlots and drunkards under a mere pretense of reforming them. He subverted the laws and institutions of the Mosaic Commonwealth and substituted an unauthorized legislation of his own. Now, in a very narrow sense, each of those had an element of truth to them. He did gather around him the poor, harlots, drunkards, publicans. Why did he do that? What do we learn about the ministry of Jesus when we acknowledge these groups of people and add women to the group. What do we acknowledge about the ministry of Jesus when we acknowledge that? He cared about all people. He gave every person an opportunity to hear and change. Some people when he, when the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and they wanted him to condemn her. And he makes the statement, he who is without sin should cast the first stone. And they walked away from the oldest to the youngest. In other words, the oldest ones knew very quickly that that's not what I'm going to do. Took the younger ones a little longer. And he said, where are your accusers? Go and sin no more. Some would suggest Jesus allowed a woman caught in adultery to think that it was okay. Do you think that? Did you think that when you first heard that story? Whoever taught you that story as an adult, maybe a teenager for the first time, if they did not interject something into that story, it can be misleading. But something has to be interjected into that story for it to make perfect sense. And the Pharisaical law required that if a woman was caught in adultery, the man should also have been brought there for that judgment against this woman. And so I've written in my Bible between the language, where is the man? Where is the man? Jesus could not condemn a person without the man also being there. He would have broken their own law. Where is the man? And only as you read beneath and have it offered, 
rather than just exactly what's in the text, uh, you don't necessarily know that. But Jesus offered all manner of classes of people, and I'm talking about any area of their life, many areas, the opportunity to find out who he was and make a change of life. It's no small thing. We were privileged to spend three and a half days on the Harding campus listening to a variety of messages. By the way, they're online. If you want to go to Harding University and look for 2021 lectureship, you can eventually see them. It may not, uh, they may not all be on there yet, but they will. Uh, Dr. Mike Ireland, presented a message that Terry and I both attended. We wanted to hear his approach. And he says, we need to be Jesus-centered congregations. And I thought I knew exactly what Mike was going to say, and I pretty much knew, but I enjoyed hearing it. And the room was full. He wasn't sure how many would come. The room was full. But a Jesus-centered congregation is allowing the message of Jesus to be taught to all people, first of all. And we need to con uh, teach so as to confront people with their sin. A Jesus-centered congregation has to talk about sin. And, of course, that involves the cross, so I amend him very loudly. And it has to involve the reality of responsibility. The responsibility of a Jesus-centered congregation isn't baptism alone. It isn't beginning the walk. It's finishing the walk. And the way he described it is growing every day to look more like Jesus. That's our mission, to convert and encourage each member to look more like Jesus day by day. And I appreciated hearing that, though I've certainly heard it before, but in a full context, I appreciated it. Jesus reached out to all people, all people. I'm going to say, when we look at Peter and Judas is carried in the upper room, Jesus knew Peter would deny him within hours, and he knew Judas Iscariot would betray him within hours. And what do we see Jesus doing? What do we see in John 13? Washing their feet. Washing their feet. I know what you're going to do, but remember what I'm doing right now. I'm washing your feet. Now, did we need Peter to deny him three times? Well, it's part of prophecy. Did we need someone from the numbers of the 12 to betray him? It's part of prophecy. But did it happen because it was prophesied or was it prophesied because it would happen? It's that simple question that it was prophesied because it would happen. It did not force them to make those decisions. And that's a prelude to some of what we'll try to apply later. Um, let's go back to our list. He disregarded not only all distinctions of society, but even those of religion he commended the idolatrous Samaritan as of greater worth than the holy priest and the pious Levite. Where did he do that? Where did the holy priest and the pious Levite come into a story that Jesus told? The good Samaritan. They walked by on the other side. The Good Samaritan, called good, that's the charge, went and helped, took from his own funds, offered to come back and pay whatever else he had not paid. And it's one of the things they 
charged Jesus as a wrongdoing, if you will. How dare you speak against the holy priest and pre preach uh, against the pious Levite and make it look like the Samaritan was the good one. Well, he was. But it was one of the charges as far as the extra judicial charges. He pretended to work miracles and invariably refused to perform them in the presence or at the request of the rabbis of the temple. Is that true? Yes. It's true. He refused to give a sign to people who had already made up their mind and he knew what was in man and he knew they would never believe it even if he did it. And there were many opportunities otherwise for them to come to believe. But it was held against him, if you will. He condemned the solemn sanctions of their holy religion. Of course, traditions. He had sat down to eat with publicans and sinners. How dare him, these pious religionists. He ate with unwashed hands. Now, do you think Jesus was out day to day, dusty, dusty streets? There was not pavement. There was not concrete. There was not probably lace-up shoes. And when people would come into a home planning to eat, if you will, it was customary for them to provide and sometimes even to wash the dirty feet of those who had come into their home. And in the same vein, if you're out all day in a dusty environment, it's still that way, you would wash your hands. One of the first things parents teach their children. We did it this way. First call. They heard first call when they were four or five or six years old. Uh, we used it at Thanksgiving. All the children knew exactly what it meant, though they had not used it in their home. First call means to go wash your hands and be close to the kitchen so when mom says ready or second call, you're at the table just like that. The food's ready, it's served, and that's not when you run to the back of the house and start preparing to come to the table. First call, second call, something we did all of our adult life with our children. Tried it Thanksgiving, it worked. Uh, it's, it's common to prepare, if you will, so we've got to figure out when did he wash, uh, when did he refuse to wash to the extent that they would charge him with something. Well, again, it was their traditions. The washing of plates, Matthew 13. They would wash the outside, he said, but you leave the inside filthy. Filthy sepulcher. Uh, they had traditions of washing of washing your hands, of washing the, the utensils, if you will. It was tradition. It wasn't practical because they were dirty and you're ready to eat. It was a tradition that they set into place. And they made it a matter of heaven or hell. And that's when traditions have gone amok. When we would make traditions and judge them to be a matter of heaven or hell. Uh, that's a no-no by any means. Uh, he disregarded the obligations of the Sabbath. We'll see that in the sermon this morning. He attended the Jewish feast, but fairly irregular, sometimes not at all. And, of course, he did ignore them as it related to honoring their presence, but he kept those feasts with his disciples. He did not do it with them knowing it. He didn't do it for show. He did it as a part of Jewish custom, uh, and he honored those. Um, he dared to declare that God could be worshipped in other places 
as well as in the holy temple. I laugh to myself when I hear that. We think the same thing. Uh, if we legislate that if a group of campers are going to be together as Christians on a given weekend and they're camping out, going to be there for another day and a half, if we would suggest you've got to worship in a building with us before it's appropriate. By the way, camping this weekend, they're going to worship in a gathering place at the campground. As a body of believers, we're going to miss them. But I'm glad they realize that God can be worshipped in other places. And they're going to do it together and men will conduct the services. And it will be something that those children will never forget if it's something they haven't participated in. I hope whoever speaks makes that comment that we can worship in other places. Of course, our children attend camp, Camp Wiregrass. They probably have learned that before. But anyway, I jumped on a soapbox. Now let me hop off. Um, he had openly and violently interfered with the temple's sacred services by driving away the cattle gathered there for sacrifice. Now, why did he do that? Because the money changers were changing the fee to exchange the money to buy the sacrifices, even the simplest of sacrifices, the sparrow, and they came in with just the right amount to offer the sacrifices based on what it should have been, and the money changers had turned it into a den of robbers and changed the fee. That will be two drachma. I thought it was one drachma. Well, it's been changed. It's two drachma. Oh, I don't get to worship today. I don't get to buy a sacrifice. That was the result. And they had to leave. And it angered Jesus, and he drove the money changers out. It reminds us, don't ever put yourself and don't put anything that you suggest that might be incorporated into our worship that's going to separate the worshiper from God. Don't separate the worshiper from God. He taught it twice at the beginning and at the end of his ministries. Uh, We've read some of the breakings of the Sanhedrin law. We'll see that as it happens. He, uh, let's go back to something that we said, and I discussed it with someone before we left. They acknowledged it, maybe fully understanding it more completely than before. We sing a song, he could have called 10,000 angels. And we should believe that that could have occurred. Angels ministered in the life of Jesus on earth. They heralded his birth. Uh, they today... Peter tells us, long to look into salvation, parakuptos. They long even today to look into salvation, suggesting that they're interested in us, of whether we will respond to a Christian message, whether we honor the teachings of the prophets and honor salvation. But it's important for us to realize that many times, and Isaiah 53 said it, he was like a lamb or sheep before the slaughter. Any of you have sheep? I don't know if anybody that wants sheep, they eat a lot of grass down to the roots, I'm told. Uh, you've got to constantly be moving them to other pastures or they'll just destroy down to the roots 
the grass that would otherwise be there. But apparently when you go to shear the sheep of its wool, it doesn't fight and it's silent. I don't know why, but it seems to be the case. Isaiah 53 suggests that Jesus was like that sheep who was silent before the shearers. Uh, there's a lot of things Jesus put up with. Some of them because he had God's will at the forefront of his mind, even in the midst of these occasions when false statements were made and false accusations were repeated, he was silent because he knew why he had come. And uh, I'm thankful for that. That may be the one area of our life that will be hard for us to be more like Jesus, to be quiet when we're being ridiculed unjustly. Um, but it is an area that we need to be more like Jesus. We'll come back, Lord willing, next Sunday for class.